Well, good morning. morning. Happy Father's Day. If you are a true Christian, then you are doubly blessed to have two fathers. Your earthly father, whether he is alive or dead, good or bad, and your heavenly father, as we have been singing and celebrating in the earlier service, our perfect heavenly father, who is our father forever. So as always, we believers have so much to be thankful for, and our two dads are among those many blessings. Around 1900, there was a baseball game played by two semi-pro teams from the towns of Benson and Wilmar, Minnesota. At the end of nine innings, the two Minnesota teams were locked in a scoreless tie. In the top of the 10th, however, the team from Benson scored a run. The other team from Wilmar came to bat in the bottom half of the 10th. Wilmar's pitcher named Tillman smacked a single. The next batter, O'Toole, smashed a terrific drive deep in the outfield. The crowd, bored until now, came to life and cheered. Tillman rounded second base and headed for third while O'Toole was digging close behind him. But as Tillman arrived at third base, he collapsed. O'Toole dared not pass him in the base path, so O'Toole half carried, half dragged Tillman the 90 feet to home plate. Amazingly, the umpire (laughs) allowed both runs. Wilmar won the game. Tillman was the winning pitcher. Tillman was also dead. He had died of a heart attack at third base. In the middle of victory, there can be sorrow. In the midst of success, there can be sadness. And that's exactly what happens today in our true story in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to read how God wins another great victory in battle for Israel through Jonathan, but his dad, King Saul, manages to turn God's victory and success into sadness and sorrow. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Dear Father, thank you today for our dads. Thank you for all of our great dads, and even for our dads that uh, aren't all they should be. I praise you for being our eternal, perfect, heavenly Father who always loves us. You never let us down. You are a good, good Father, as we sang. You're always faithful and loyal, even when we are not loyal to you. We pray for our world this morning, our nation, that many will turn to you and come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. Help those here this morning and those listening and watching who have both spoken needs and unspoken needs. Help us today as we study your word to learn what you would teach us through your spirit. And we ask this in Christ's almighty name. Amen. Today we have a long chapter, so let's begin. We start with the last verse of chapter 13. Now, a Philistine garrison took control of the pass at Michmash. I'll show you a map in a moment of that. That same day, beginning in chapter 14, verse 1, Saul's son Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. However, Jonathan did not tell his father. Now, in our study last time, you remember that King Saul's son Jonathan attacked a Philistine garrison, and that started the war for Israel's independence from Philistine tyranny. Today, Jonathan once again takes the lead against the enemy. And I want you to notice that Jonathan didn't wait. He decided to act on the same day that the Philistines took control of this pass at Michmash. Now, why didn't Jonathan tell his father, King Saul, what he was going to do? Well, I think there's probably at least two reasons. First of all, if uh, Jonathan had told his father Saul, Saul would have nixed it. He would have vetoed the idea. 
Saul liked to be in control. He was something what we would call a control freak. And if there were Philistine spies in the army camp of Israel, then they could learn this plan and Jonathan's secret mission would no longer be a secret. Now, while Jonathan is about to do this, what is his father, King Saul, doing? Let's look at that in verse 2. Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree in Migron on the outskirts of Gibeah. Gibeah was Saul's hometown, probably base of operations for his kingdom. The troops with him numbered about 600. Now let's show you a map here of where these things are. And let's get our pointer. Now, of course, Jerusalem is here in the south. Let's, let's get a different color. Let's do a green. I think you might be able to see that better. Anyway, Jerusalem's here in the south. Then Gibeah is here north of Jerusalem in the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's hometown, where he's staying under the palm ground tree. Then up here is Michmash. And in a minute, we're going to see Jonathan's going to go from uh, where the troops, some troops were at Geba across to Michmash. And we'll talk about because here's this pass that we're going to uh, look at in just a moment. So Saul's resting under his own personal shade tree. And Samuel is no longer the counselor for the king. So Saul has a new advisor. And let's look at that beginning in verse 3. Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, the priestly breastplate, was also there. Ahijah was the son of Ahitub, the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Jonathan had left. Now, who was Ahijah? Well, Ahijah was Eli's great-grandson. And who was Eli? Remember, way back at the beginning of this book, Eli was the high priest who had been Samuel's boyhood mentor. But Eli, Eli was also the father of Hophni and Phinehas, the two meat-loving, woman-chasing priests whose wickedness was so great that God judged all of Eli's family for multiple generations. And so God had promised that Eli's priestly family would eventually come to ruin. So get the picture here that the author of 1 Samuel is painting. Jonathan, the crown prince, is acting while his father is passively waiting under a shade tree. Saul should have been the one to have taken the initiative to fight the Philistines, not his son. And Saul's advisor is a priest from Eli's family, which was under God's judgment. But you remember our study two weeks ago in 1 Samuel chapter 13? God had pronounced judgment on Saul's family as a result of his disobedience. So we have a king under God's judgment. We have a priest's family under God's judgment. And so who is taking the lead? Well, it's Jonathan. Now, the writer goes into some very specific topographical features of this treacherous terrain that Jonathan is about to engage in this daring commando raid. So let's look in verse 4. There were sharp columns or cliffs of rock on both sides of the pass. This is the modern Wadi Suenuit in Israel, that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. Now, one of these columns or cliffs was named Bozes, which means slippery, and the other was named Senna, which means thorny. We'll talk about that. One stood to the north in front of Michmash and the other to the south in front of Geba. Now, there's no way that you can understand how perilous this mission was unless I show you some maps and some photos. And by the way, everything that is, every detail in this account, as it is with all of Bible geography, all of Bible topography, every detail is absolutely correct. So let's get, take back um, our pointer. And here, once again, Jerusalem in the south, the Jordan River over here to the east. And so, once again, Gibeah is here where Saul is. And don't pay too much attention to all the arrows because it's, it's chart charting the battle that we're going to read about. But anyway, Jonathan is here, Michmash is up here, and so Senna was on one side on the south, Bozes was on the other side on the north, and so he has to cross a ravine. Well, let's look at that today in modern Israel. Okay, so here is Michmash. Here is where the Israelite troops would have been. And so Bozes would have been on this uh, side, Senna on the other side, and the pass 
uh, comes all the way around this way. So let's look then at what this looks like in terms of more detail. Here is this canyon. It's really a canyon. Water would flow through it in, in rainy times. Then it's very deep, and notice how steep the walls are of this. And then looking at the bottom, this you see this little figure here? This is a person, and this is cattle down here. So this was a huge, and this is just at the entrance. It goes further in, and the further in you go, the steeper it gets. So most soldiers would have gone around the outside of this canyon, of this ravine, this gorge, to get to the Philistine soldiers. And, but that's not Jonathan's plan. He's planning a surprise attack. So what he's going to do, he's going to climb down the slippery side, and then he's going to let the Philistines see him. Then he's going to climb up the thorny side to attack them. Now, no one in their right mind would have this kind of strategy. But this is what Jonathan plans to do, and we're going to see why he does that. So while King Saul again is resting in the shade, his son is literally putting his life in his hands as he rock climbs to attack the enemy that Saul should have been attacking. And the question is, why did Jonathan do this? Was he a daredevil? Was he foolhardy? Was he a hothead? No. Let's look at that in verse 6. Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men, the Philistines. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. This is one of the greatest statements of faith in the entire Bible. Jonathan was not presumptuous because he says, perhaps the Lord will help them. Jonathan wasn't putting God in a box. He wasn't trying to force God's hand. But on the other hand, Jonathan did not limit God's power. He says, nothing can keep the Lord from saving. God can deliver if he has a few soldiers or many. Brothers and sisters, this is the kind of balanced faith that we as Christians need. We must not presume on God, put God in a box, try to force him to do things our way. On the other hand, we must trust him to be God. We must not limit his power. So Jonathan strikes this beautiful balance between those two extremes. And if you think that's great, look at his armor bearer in verse 7. His armor bearer responded, do what is in your heart, Jonathan. You choose. I'm right here with you. Whatever you decide. This is one of the great examples of loyalty in the Bible. This armor bearer was ready to die with Jonathan in this daring, daunting mission. A good leader has influence over the people she or he leads. Leadership is not about barking out orders. A dog can bark. Being a leader is about having the vision to see a goal and inspiring people to achieve that goal together with you. Christian, are you that kind of a leader? Every one of you is a leader over somebody. Oh, we need to have the kind of leadership that Jonathan exhibits here. Verse 8. All right, Jonathan replied, we'll cross over to the men and let's see them and let them see us. If they say, wait until we reach you, which meant they would have had to have come down into the ravine, then we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if the soldiers, the Philistine soldiers, say, come on up, then we'll go up because the Lord has handed them over to us. That will be our sign. So once again, Jonathan is trusting the Lord with this very, very simple plan. They're going to climb down into the gorge, let the soldiers spot them, and then depending on what the soldiers say, call out to them, that will providentially be God's sign to attack or not to attack. Verse 11. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes, literally the caves, where they've been hiding. The men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come on, come on up, and we'll teach you a lesson, they said. 
Jonathan and his attendant then climb down the slippery slope. And then the Philistines on the other side look down and see them. They call them Hebrews, and here that's a derogatory term. Now it's true, remember, we saw that there were many scared Israeli soldiers who did go hide in holes and in caves. So the ridicule of these Philistine soldiers was founded in a little bit, but basically here the, in, in Hebrew, the, the put down is they're calling Jonathan and his armor bearer cavemen, and they're daring them to come up. But, and of course, we have the same phrase today. We say, I'll teach you a thing or two. We say the same thing today. But the Philistines expected Jonathan and his assistant to come out of the gorge, out of the mouth of the gorge, come around so they would give those troops plenty of time to get ready for them. What the last thing that they expected was that these Neanderthal Hebrews would crawl up the face of this cliff through thorns. And once again, let's look at it. Here again is the gorge, and they would have had to, have, Jonathan and his armor bearer were down here, and they would have had to have climbed. Of course, this is the, the uh, uh, lesser elevation further in, it's, it's much steeper. So let's see what happened in verse 12, the last part of verse 12. Follow me, Jonathan told his armor bearer, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. What faith? Jonathan climbed up, now this is the thorny side, using his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. And then when they got to the top, Jonathan cut them down and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. Literally, the amount of, of uh, ground it would take a, a cow or a, a, a bull to plow in about a day. This is the greatest rock climbing feat in the Bible. And it's also one of the greatest displays of hand-to-hand -hand combat against insurmountable odds. The odds were 10 to 1. 20 Philistines, 2 Hebrews. But before the Philistines could call out Dagon, their god, or finish their poker and beer, Jonathan and his armor bearer fighting in tandem in this half acre had taught 20 Philistines a lesson about God that they would never forget. I've bragged on Jonathan's faith, but what is faith? Faith is trusting in the Lord because we believe that what he says in his word is true. And what is it that God had promised Israel? Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 26 in verse 7 and following. You will pursue your enemies, Israel, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will pursue 100, and a 100 of you will pursue 10,000. Your enemies will fall before you by the sword. The God promised that they would win against even greater odds than Jonathan and his armor bearer faced. Jonathan just took God at his word. Do you, Christian, have that kind of faith? When you read the Bible, either in a printed edition or on your phone or on your laptop or whatever form you read the Bible now, when God says something to you in that book, do you just believe it? And are you willing to act on it? God honored Jonathan's faith by routing the enemy. Let's look beginning in verse 15. Terror spread through the Philistine camp and the open fields to all the troops. Even the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified. Remember, the Philistines had sent out three raiding parties in, in three different strategic points of Israel. The earth shook and terror spread from God. Jonathan's surprise attack both uh, confused and confounded the Philistines, but God multiplied the terror by sending an earthquake. The all-powerful God of the universe was now fighting for his people. And you don't even want to mess with God when he starts fighting someone. Verse 16, when Saul's watchman in Gibeah of Benjamin, again to the south, Looked, they saw the panicking Philistine troops scattering in every direction. So Saul said to the troops with him, Call the roll and determine who's left us. They called the roll and saw that Jonathan and his armor bearer were gone. 
when Saul's watchman started looking out and seeing all the Philistine troops fleeing, he reported what was going on. And I think that Saul probably suspected that this was Jonathan. Jonathan was the only man in Israel brave enough, or some people might say stupid enough, to attempt such a thing. And sure enough, when the roll was called over yonder, Jonathan was the it guy. And now, unfortunately, we're going to begin to see in this battle just how erratic and how flawed Saul was as a leader, beginning in 18. Saul told Ahijah, bring the ark of God, for it was with the Israelites at that time. While Saul spoke to the priest, the panic in the Philistine camp increased in intensity. So Saul said to the priest, stop what you're doing. Now, Saul started to use God's ark for an inquiry. We're not exactly sure, perhaps superstitiously, perhaps legitimately, but then when the battle is intensifies among the Philistines, Saul abruptly stops the priest. Well, that's a bad call. Verse 20, Saul and all the troops with him assembled and marched to the battle, and there the Philistines were fighting against each other in great confusion. The, the, the Israelis didn't have to uh, do much because the Philistines were already at each other's throats. Verse 21, there were Hebrews from the area who had gone earlier into the camp to join the Philistines, but even they joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites' men who had been hiding in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they also joined Saul and Jonathan in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day. God supernaturally handed this decisive battle to Saul and his army. The victory was so sure that two groups came out of the woodwork to help the Israeli soldiers under Saul. First, the deserters who had given up and joined the Philistines, they rejoined the ranks of Israel's soldiers. And all the guys that were in hiding, that were, had been afraid before, they came out of hiding and took their places in battle formation. But the author of 1 Samuel is clear at the, in the first part of verse 23. It wasn't the deserters. It wasn't the guys who came back. It wasn't Saul. It wasn't the soldiers. It was the Lord who saved Israel that day. But poor, foolish Saul manages in this victory to snatch, or we would say he snatches defeat from the jaws of of victory, the last part of verse 23. The battle extended beyond Beth Aven, and the men of Israel were worn out that day. For Saul had placed the troops under an oath. And here's what Saul's oath or vow was The man who eats food before evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, is cursed. So none of the troops tasted any food. Saul swore this rash oath, forcing his soldiers to fast all day long while they were pursuing the enemy over steep terrain. Now, from this place in Israel down to the seacoast, the elevation drops about 2,000 feet uh, over just a few miles. So they have had vital food energy withheld from them at the very time that they most need it. This places all the soldiers under a great disadvantage. Why was Saul doing this? probably superstitiously to get on God's good side, to show off who knows what nonsense was in his head at this time. Fellow believer, let me just just exhort you. Beware of making rash promises or vows or oaths to God that you can't ever keep. We don't need to bargain and barter with God. God already favors us in Christ. We have all we need as believers in Christ right now if we would simply claim it and act on it. We don't ever need to manipulate God because God will not be manipulated by us. Verse 25, everyone went into the forest and there was honey on the ground. When the troops entered the forest, they saw the flow of honey, but none of them ate any of it because they feared the oath. The soldiers found wild honey dripping in the forest. 
but they were afraid to eat it, of course, because of this curse that Saul had pronounced on them. Do you remember God's promise over and over and in your notes that I email you? Uh, I give you all the references again and again where God promised that Israel would inherit a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Well, here it was. Verse 27. However, Jonathan had not heard his father make the troops swear the oath. He reached out the end of the staff he was carrying and dipped it in the honeycomb so the bees wouldn't get him. When he ate the honey, he had renewed energy. Literally in Hebrew, his eyes brightened, and you can just picture that. Honey, honey of course, is one of the most wonderful of all foods. Jonathan did the right thing. He did the smart thing to eat some honey. It gave him energy. But he's violated now his father's unreasonable oath because he didn't know about it. Verse 28. Then one of the troops said, Your father made the troops solemnly swear. The man who eats food today is cursed. And the troops are exhausted. Jonathan replied, My father has brought trouble to the land. Just look at how I have renewed energy, or my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little honey. How much better if the troops had eaten freely today from the plunder they took from their enemies? Then the slaughter of the Philistines would have been much greater. When one of the truths uh, mentioned this to Jonathan about his father's curse, Jonathan shows what great common sense he had, what wisdom he had as a very, very young man. Jonathan couldn't have been more than a teenager at this point, but such God-given wisdom, such obedience to God. Verse 31, the Israelites struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash all the way to Ajalon. Since the, Phil the Israelites were completely exhausted, they rushed the plunder, took sheep, cattle, and calves, slaughtered them on the ground, and ate meat with the blood still in it. Some reported to Saul, look, the troops are sinning against the Lord by eating meat with the blood still in it. Here's another bad result of, Jonathan, of, of Saul's stupid oath. At the end of the day, when the fast has expired, the soldiers are ravenously hungry. So what do they do? They rush, kill, eat these animals that they've plundered from the Philistines, but they sin by eating the meat with the blood still in it, which God had strictly forbidden multiple times, way back from Genesis 9 all the way through Leviticus uh, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. This, of course, was a sin that when they violated God's law. But at least Saul, at this point, does the right thing. He's caused this meltdown, but he does the right thing in verse 33. Saul said, you have been unfaithful. Roll a large stone over here at once. He then said, go among the troops and say to them, each man must bring me his ox or his sheep. Do the slaughtering here so that the blood could drain out. And then you can eat. Don't sin against the Lord by eating meat with the blood in it. So every one of the troops brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had built an altar to the Lord. You know, I feel sorry for Saul. He often wanted to do the right thing, but he often did it in the wrong way. At least he's ordering his soldiers to obey God's word. And perhaps he's building this altar to try to make up for what they had done wrong. But sadly, again and again, we're going to see how Saul can't get his act together spiritually and usually it's because he just wouldn't obey the Lord. In this case he did right to have the men slaughter in the in the prescribed way. Verse 36, Saul said let's go down to the Philistines tonight and plunder them until morning. Don't let even one of them remain. Do whatever you want the troops replied. But the priest said we must consult God here. So Saul inquired of God, should I go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? But God did not answer him that day. Saul was so blessed to have the absolute loyalty of his soldiers. Again and again, they were loyal and did what he asked until, of course, he pushes them to an extreme. But Saul's previous disobedience meant that God was no longer giving Saul his vote of confidence. Now, why didn't God answer Saul here? 
Well, there's a very obvious reason. Way back when God called and anointed and set up Saul as king, God had instructed him from the very beginning to attack and to destroy the Philistines. We don't have to ask if something is God's will if it's already spelled out by God in his word. Here God had spelled it out to Saul. So God didn't have to answer Saul because he'd already told him what to do. And of course, remember shortly before this, Saul was going to inquire by God, but then he pulls the plug. You know, we can't play games with God like Saul does so often. So Saul jumps to the false conclusion now, because God doesn't answer him, that this must be the fault of somebody sinning in the, the military camp. So let's see what happens. Verse 38. Saul said, all of you leaders of the troops come here. Let us investigate how this sin has occurred today. Of course, that already sinned because of the, uh, the eating the meat with blood in it. As surely as the Lord lives who saves Israel, even if it is because of my son Jonathan, he must die. Not one of the troops answered him. Saul was correct that there were problems, but most of the problems were of his own making. Once again, Saul here is swearing a vow by God's own life, but he's doing it rashly without thinking. He says that even if Jonathan is the guilty party, he has to die. And of course, none of the troops answer because many of them already know that Jonathan has violated his father's uh, fast earlier with the honey. Verse 40, so Saul said to all Israel, you will be on one side and I and my son Jonathan will be on the other. And the troops replied, notice again, do whatever you want. So Saul said to the Lord, God of Israel, give us the right decision. Jonathan and Saul were selected and the troops were cleared of the charge. Then Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son Jonathan. And Jonathan was selected. Apparently what was going on, here you see an illust uh, a model of what the high priest's garments were like. There was this breastplate with the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Inside this ephod was a pocket where there were two stones. Apparently the Urim and the Thummim, one was a yes, one was a no, and they mixed them up and the one that came out was the yes. So by using this method, which God allowed at the time, Jonathan gets selected. Now why does God allow that to happen? God's sovereignly in control of this with the high priest. Well, God isn't trying to blame Jonathan. God's trying to expose Saul's stupidity to his troops in the world. Verse 43, Saul commanded him, tell me what you did. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of the staff I was carrying, and I'm ready to die. Unlike his father, who wouldn't face the music, Jonathan was ready to take the consequences for his actions, even if it was unjust, even if it was unfair, Jonathan was ready to submit, not like his father. So, let's see what happens. Saul was like Hosea's pancake, remember that? You slap some pancake batter on a hot griddle and you leave it there. And what happens? It burns on one side and it's raw on the other. Saul just, he goes from one extreme to the other. And I think we missed the verse back here. Um, no, the verse comes next. Did I read 43 and 44? I have not read them yet. But I didn't read 44. Well, it's not like me to get lost, but I just got lost, okay? Fortunately, not theologically lost, just temporarily lost. Okay, Saul declared to him, may God punish me and do so severely if you do not die, Jonathan. Okay, so he's swinging between two extremes. Remember Saul's comment uh, to the men who had opposed him when he first came into his kingship? This guy, some men had said, who were really bad guys, they said, we aren't going to have this guy rule over us. So what does Saul do? He forgives them. He lets them off, and they were lowlifes. And now his son, who has really done nothing wrong except break a rash vow of his father, now his son um, has to die. So that's the example of going to one extreme or the other, like Hosea's pancake burned on one side, raw on the other. So let me say to you dads, you parents, all of us who are leaders, 
We need to learn to be consistent. Saul was not consistent. There's nothing that exasperates and frustrates children or employees or followers like inconsistency in a leader. Don't swing back and forth between wild extremes like a monkey swinging between trees in the jungle. Don't be overly harsh sometimes and overly lax at others. It's not that we make the same decision all the time, but people need to count on us that we're going to be consistently fair, consistently just. And Saul was not. Okay, down to 45. I think we're back on track now. But the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who accomplished such great deliverance for Israel? No, as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he worked with God's help today. Notice, they gave God the credit, recognizing that God had used Jonathan. So the people redeemed Jonathan, and he did not die. Saul's own soldiers here rebuke his extremism. They rescue Jonathan out of his hand and basically give the king a vote of no confidence. Saul's irrational overreaction here is a foreshadow of what we're going to see in the following chapters, not only against David, but even against Saul's own son, Jonathan. Then the last verse we'll do this today, verse 46. Then Saul gave up the pursuit of the Philistines. And the Philistines returned to their own territory. Saul could have had a decisive victory that day, but it's marred by him giving up the pursuit, letting them go in retreat, and of course that lets the Philistines go back home, regroup to fight another day, and the next time they come out, they're going to bring a champion who is a giant named Goliath, and Saul will rue the day that he has allowed this to happen, but God's still in charge, and we know what happens to Goliath. Again, Saul's leadership is so flawed, it's so poor as a king and a general. Two last points, and we're done. We observe here what a splendid king Jonathan would have been. Talk about a man after God's own heart. That was Jonathan. But what happened? If only Saul had not disobeyed and forfeited the dynasty, Jonathan was blocked from becoming king, blocked from success in his life because his dad struck out. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Friend, do you feel that you've gotten a raw deal in life because of the bad decisions of your dad or maybe your mom? If so, then you need to learn from dear Jonathan. In this 21st century, we feel that it's all about us. It's our rights, our fulfillment, our dreams. Jonathan didn't think that way. For Jonathan, he saw that the kingdom, it wasn't his kingdom. It wasn't his father's kingdom, it was God's kingdom. For, for Jonathan, the kingdom was not his to seize, it wasn't his to rule. It was his kingdom to serve. And Jesus said it best. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Last point. This was one of Jonathan's finest hours because at this point he's becoming Israel's deliverer, their savior with a small s. The Hebrew word for deliverance, as you can see here, is Yeshua. Anybody recognize that? That's Jesus' name in Hebrew. It means savior. Brave Jonathan starts this whole epic battle by risking his life to climb down a slippery cliff and then climb up a thorny cliff and face an implacable foe. Our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the bravest man who ever lived. Jesus saved us by giving himself for us. Jesus didn't slip and trip accidentally into death. Jesus willingly laid down his life. He willingly let them kill him. He went down that slippery place into the very pains of hell for us. And then Jesus wore, in addition to suffering hell for us, Jesus wore a crown of thorns, the cruel mocking crown that we deserved. Friend, do you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again? Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross as the only way to make you forever right with God? 
Are you trusting in Jesus as your only Savior, Lord, and God? And to all of us physical and spiritual dads, God doesn't ask us to save anybody. God doesn't ask us to save our families. He doesn't ask us to save our friends. But what God does ask of us is to do our best, to do our bravest for our children, our disciples, to be like Jesus and give them ourselves in love, in leadership, and in prayer. Let's close in prayer. Father, you are the best dad. We are nothing without you. But in your grace, you are pleased to use us for your glory. Pray that you would use all of us this week. Help us to put your kingdom, your righteousness first. In Jesus' awesome name, amen. God bless you, and I appreciate